Good morning. Our littlest ones are dismissed to uh, go and study God's Word and have a lot of fun over there doing it. We hope you'll have fun here as we study God's Word. This morning is my last sermon on part one of the series on the Gospel of Mark. This year, Lord willing, we will pick back up for part two of our study through the Gospel of Mark next year and finish around Easter, which I think would be very appropriate to, to do it that way. In the meantime, next Sunday, I want to invite all of you back. I'll be starting a new series in the Old Testament. We will be studying in the Minor Prophet, but by no means unimportant, uh, Amos. And the series will be about national revival. And it's something that, as we know, our country and our world and our church and our lives desperately need is revival. And so we're going to study that theme in the book of Amos. And so I'd like you to come back over the next weeks leading up to the national elections uh, in November and then beyond that. So I, I trust that that will be a series of great blessing to you as we do that. Today, though, we will finish Act 2 of Mark's marvelous three-act drama of Jesus' life that proves to us who Jesus is and what a disciple is like. And so I'd like to show you one more time the outline that I have been using about the Gospel of Mark that asks the big question, what is a disciple of Jesus Christ? Act 1, which was basically the first uh, eight chapters, asked or taught us that a disciple believes in Jesus' person. And Act 2, we have seen, is a disciple accepts Jesus' mission and then hopefully beginning next year, we will do the remaining act uh, three, a disciple remains faithful to Jesus, leading to the end of the book. As the curtain falls on this final scene of act two in Mark's gospel, Jesus heals a man named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus pictures more than anyone else so far in Mark what a true disciple is like. I'd like to just uh, ask the Lord's blessing on our time of study together. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father... Thank you for this amazing book of Mark that you have so graciously left as one of the 66 books of the Bible for us to study. And I pray this morning, as has been my prayer through all the other long months that we studied, that you would be glorified, that we would be edified, that we would come away, that each person would leave today with some challenge, some word directly from you and your spirit for, that would change our lives, that would alter the way that we... Um, approach life and serve you. So we ask this now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's begin reading in Mark chapter 10, verse 46, and all the verses are projected here on the screen with part of the outline. Verse 46, they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. As he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road. Jericho, along with the city of Damascus, is one of the world's oldest continuously inhabited cities. Joshua conquered the old city of Jericho, which is about five miles from the Jordan River. Now this scene, actually here in the foreground, no, go back, thank you. This scene here in the foreground is... The, are the ruins of the city that Joshua conquered back in the Old Testament. But once you cross this road, this is modern Jericho. In the distance is the Jordan River, so this is looking east. Uh, and so this was the old city uh, that we are, know is so familiar from the Old Testament. Now from there, it is another 20 miles and a very steep 3,500-foot climb up a very winding road to the holy city. Before Jesus was born, Herod the Great built a new Jericho near the old city. It became Herod's winter palace and a resort uh, that was famous for its fragrant flowers and its spice groves that wafted aromas through the breeze. New Jericho was also a hangout for priests for merchants, and for gangsters like Zacchaeus. Pilgrims often stopped here in Jericho uh, to rest overnight on their way to Jerusalem, to festivals there, and that's basically what brought Jesus and his disciples to Jericho on this particular occasion. They were heading for Jesus' last, final Passover in Jerusalem, and they made a 
quick stop here in Jericho. So with all the pilgrims, the merchants, and all these other people coming through, there was lots of money. And of course, that brought out the beggars, people like Bartimaeus. Here, no, let's go back. Uh, this is, uh, the, again, the ruins of the old city of Jericho. This is now looking west. And this was our, is what is left of the new Jericho that Herod built. And you can see that immediately on the other side of this little enclave here, it starts going very high in elevation. So let's go forward now. We're going to look at a couple of NASA satellite shots. This is the, the nation of Israel here, Mediterranean Sea, west coast of Israel, Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. And so in this, Jericho would be about here, just east of the Jordan, and then Jerusalem would be about here. Now, I want to take this same shot from another satellite point of view. Let's go forward. This is looking straight down from space. Again, the Dead Sea. This is the country of Jordan over here. This is Israel. This is the Jordan River. And this little part right here would be old, new, and ancient Jericho. And then if you move straight over here, I believe that this area up in the mountains, that is Jerusalem there. So you see the climb from here, which is really below sea level in Jericho, up to 3,500 feet uh, beyond that is Jerusalem. So that just gives you the setting geographically, topographically of our story today. Mark translates Bartimaeus' uh, Aramaic last name into Greek for his Roman readers. Most of Mark's readers spoke uh, Latin, and they spoke Greek. They did not speak Aramaic. Um, and so Bartimaeus means the son of Timaeus. That is like our English last name Johnson, which means the son of John, of course, in ancient times. Timaeus was a famous Greek name that we find in Plato's writings. Bartimaeus was probably a Gentile, and there were many Gentiles who lived in Jericho because of the trade. We don't know Bartimaeus' first name, but it's very interesting that he is the only person that Jesus healed in the Mark's gospel whose name is mentioned. Nobody else of all the people Jesus healed is their name mentioned, only Bartimaeus. Now, why would that be the case? Why would Mark single out Bartimaeus and no one else? Two possibilities. It's possible that Bartimaeus, after he became a Christian, later lived in Rome and was actually known to Mark's Roman readers. But there's an even stronger possibility of why Mark mentions Zacchaeus, or Zachar, or I'll get it right in a moment, Bartimaeus' name. Uh, and that is that every time in Mark's gospel Jesus calls a disciple, their name is given. Simon and Andrew, James and John, the 12 apostles. Every time Jesus calls a disciple, their name's mentioned. So he calls... Bartimaeus as his disciple, so we have his name. The only person Jesus calls in the Gospel of Mark whose name is not mentioned is the rich young ruler. And why? The rich young ruler did not accept Jesus' call to be his disciple. So this is really a story of being called to be Jesus' disciple. Now, let's move forward then. Well, before I move on, I would like to say something. The fact that Jesus would call all of his disciples by name shows how deeply personal discipleship is. And Jesus calls us to be his disciples. We may not hear our name, but he nevertheless calls us personally and individually. And what a beautiful thing of how God doesn't just deal with us as a group. He deals with us as individuals, which shows how special each one of us is to God. Now, now let's move on to verse 47. When Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. This is the second of four times in Mark where Jesus is called the Nazarene. This means much more than just Jesus hailing from the town of Nazareth. Nazarene emphasizes that Jesus had a special dedication to God in his ministry. It's not exactly in the same sense as Samson being the Nazarene in the Old Testament, or Nazarite. Uh, same word is used in the Greek Old Testament. But he did have a special dedication to God. 
Bartimaeus is an incredible picture of how an unbeliever ought to become a Christian. Let's look at this. Bartimaeus, first of all, believed that Jesus was Messiah. Son of David is one of many Old Testament titles of the Messiah. This is the only time in Mark's gospel where Jesus is addressed by this unique title. No one else, only Bartimaeus, calls him Son of David. And Bartimaeus believed that Jesus could really do what the Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would do. In Isaiah 53, which we have here at the bottom, is a prediction of what the Messiah would do. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. So Jesus directly fulfilled these prophecies about healing the blind, healing the deaf, healing others. No one in the whole Bible but Jesus ever restored sight to the permanently blind. There's other stories you may remember of people being temporarily blind and having their sight restored, like Paul when he was converted. No one else ever cures a permanently blind person, only Jesus. This is a prediction that the Messiah would do it, then so who is Jesus? He must be the Messiah, the Old Testament prophet, priest, and king who would lead Israel. And that hasn't been totally fulfilled yet. It will be at the second coming of Jesus to earth. Second, Bartimaeus was physically blind, and that pictures the spiritual blindness of unbelievers. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, in their case, that is in the case of unbelievers, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When we try to talk to people who aren't Christians, one of the reasons, the main reason why they don't get it, their minds have been blinded. And there's only one cure from that. Just as Jesus cured Bartimaeus, so Jesus through his Holy Spirit must pull the blinders from the eyes and from the minds of unbelievers so that they will understand the gospel and believe and be saved. Third, Bartimaeus admitted his desperate need, and he cried out for mercy. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is what? Rich in mercy. I love that. Because of his great love that he, has, that he had for us, made us alive with who? The Messiah. Even though we were dead in trespasses. Friend, don't ever ask God for justice. Because if we ask God for justice, we are godless, guilty sinners, and we deserve hell. That's the just thing if God gave us justice. But it is God's mercy who can save us and send us to heaven. An artist was going to paint a portrait of an older lady who was quite vain. This lady said, young man, mind you, do me justice. And many of you have heard it. The artist replied, Madam, what you need is not justice, but mercy. (laughs) And of course, that is what we all need, not in a portrait, but in salvation. Also, verse 5 of Titus chapter 3 tells us, God saved us, not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy. Have you ever in your life cried out, to Jesus, like Bartimaeus did, to save you by his mercy. And you know what is the marvel of the good news of the gospel? He has already shown you mercy. 2,000 years before you were born, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That was the greatest outpouring of mercy in the history of the world. And all God asks you to do is to simply claim that gift of mercy that is already yours if you will receive it by faith. It's already been paid for. We simply have to receive it. Verse 48 of chapter 10. Many people told Bartimaeus to keep quiet, told him to shut up. But he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. The crowd tried to silence Bartimaeus because they thought Jesus was too important to be bothered with a beggar. But no one could silence Bartimaeus. Their rebuke only made him more persistent. 
What a guy. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. So the people called the blind man. Now they've changed their tune. First they wanted to shut him up, and now they, they, they tell him, have courage. The NIV here is very good translation of the Greek. Cheer up. Get up. Jesus is calling for you. So Bartimaeus threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. God's mercy is so great that when Bartimaeus called out to Jesus, it stopped deity in his tracks. What does the Psalm 23 tell us? The Lord is my shepherd. And the shepherd always stops when he hears a bleeding lamb. Bleating lamb. Jesus is on his way to die in Jerusalem. Yet he takes time for this penniless, powerless person. That is the heart of God that sent Jesus to earth to save us. Verse 51. Then Jesus answered Bartimaeus, What do you want me to do for you? Rabuni, <laughs> the, the blind man told him, I want to see. Bartimaeus used yet another title of honor for Jesus. Rabuni means in Aramaic, my Lord, or my master. Only one other person in the Gospels ever calls Jesus this. Do you remember who it was? Mary Magdalene at the tomb after Jesus arose from the dead. Only Mary ever calls Jesus by this name. Bartimaeus is the other person. Jesus set the example 2,000 years ago of how to treat folks with disabilities. Jesus treats Bartimaeus as a person, not a problem. Jesus already knew Bartimaeus' need, but he showed him respect by letting him speak for himself and express his own wishes. Jesus didn't embarrass Bartimaeus by treating him like a misfit or a victim. And Jesus does not do something to Bartimaeus. Jesus does something with Bartimaeus when he becomes his disciple. Let me just challenge you. Don't ask God to do things for you. Ask God to do something with you. An amazing difference. And then watch what God will do to answer your prayer. Let's learn from Jesus' example here how to show kindness and respect to all people, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, their wealth or poverty, their deed or their need. There is a famous commercial that was done nationwide a number of years ago encouraging people in our country to give people with disabilities a chance. And I loved it because it said, what is it that you think someone with disabilities cannot do? President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. President John F. Kennedy wore a back brace. President Ronald Reagan wore a hearing aid. And the, the, the commercial ends, or the campaign ends. So what was it that you said that a person with disabilities cannot do? I love these pictures that shows ministry, even if it's secular to, un, to um, people that we say with disabilities. This man showing this girl with a smart wheelchair that is computer operated. These people being taught to walk with canes who are perhaps newly blind. These Muslim girls learning how to do sign language. This veteran who lost his legs defending our freedom, being taught to walk anew with artificial legs. This girl helping this lady who's had a stroke or some other disability to learn to walk again. And my favorite here in the this, this center, this little girl hugging her dog who's just graduated from dog school, learning to be a helper. And see, she's got his diploma in her hand and he's got his mortarboard on. I just, boy, I'm going to cry if I see that much more. We got to get going. <laughs> Verse 52. Go your way, Jesus told him. Your faith has healed you. We'll talk about that. Immediately, Bartimaeus could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. This is the last healing miracle in Mark's gospel. The Greek verb here, sozo, 
cannot just be translated healed, it can also be translated saved. Bartimaeus experienced both physical healing and spiritual healing or salvation that day. Now let's talk about this phrase Jesus says, your faith has healed, your faith has saved you. Faith does not save us itself. Faith is the means of receiving God's gift of salvation. God's hand reaching down and offering us salvation, that is grace. Our hand reaching up to receive that gift, that is faith. And so it is the means by which we receive God's healing and salvation. Mark tells us that Jesus restored Bartimaeus' sight instantaneously. This is an astonishing miracle of creation that only God the Creator could do. Someone born permanently blind or who has been uh, by accident permanently blind, for them to see 2020 in an instant is not just to create them new eyes, it is to create the pathways to the brain and the entire part of our mind that interprets visual stimuli. It is an astonishing miracle of creation and only one person in the universe can do that, God. So who is Jesus? He is God. And that is also a picture of how fast we get saved. When we put our faith in the crucified, risen Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, Lord, and God, He instantly saves us. Again, a miracle that only God can do. Four quick lessons I'd like for us to come away with before we close today. First, well-meaning people can hinder the unsaved from coming to Christ. The crowds meant well to respect Jesus, but they were blind to Bartimaeus' need. Brother, sister in Christ, ask God to open your eyes so that you do not stand in the way of someone becoming a Christian. Sadly, it is very common for Christians to keep someone from coming to Christ by our actions or our attitudes. I know a person who wants very much their family to become Christians. But this person is so legalistic, so harsh, so judgmental that they are the person standing in the way humanly of their family coming to Christ, and they're blind to it. Don't do that. Ask God to open your eyes that you do not stand in the way of someone becoming a Christian. Second, don't let others stand in your way of becoming a Christian. Do you realize Bartimaeus would never have been healed that day? He would never have been saved that day if he had been listened to or he had been intimidated by that crowd. As I witness to people, one of the excuses that I often hear is, well, I'd really like to become a Christian, but if I do, what will my family think? What will my friends think? You know how to answer that objection? Do you love your family? Do you love your friends? Well, then trust in Christ. Let Him give you spiritual sight, and then you can be His instrument in love and grace to reach out to them for them to have the same joy of salvation that you do. It's not an excuse. Don't let others stand in your way of becoming a Christian. Third, take advantage of your opportunity to trust in Christ today if you never have. God is merciful, rich in mercy, and He often gives us many chances to become a Christian. But that day was Bartimaeus' only chance. Why? Jesus never passed that way again. When Jesus went from Jericho to Jerusalem, he died in Jerusalem, was buried, arose, and 40 days later he ascended to heaven. He never went back to Jericho. If Bartimaeus had not taken advantage of his opportunity that day, he would have been lost forever. Many years ago, the famous preacher D.L. Moody in Chicago, Illinois, had a custom of every Sunday he would give an altar call and an opportunity to people to trust in Christ as Savior at the end of the service. Now, that's not our tradition here, although I might surprise you sometime and actually do that. But I do, as you know, regularly present the gospel and challenge people here to trust in Christ. That particular Sunday, Moody did not do it. The next week was the Chicago fire, 
And many of the people who heard him preach that night, who were not saved, died in the fire and went to a worse fire in hell. After that, Moody said, I will never preach again without giving unbelievers the opportunity to trust in Christ because it might be their last time to ever hear the gospel. I don't share that to scare you, but I share that to challenge you that none of us knows when we walk out this door today what is going to happen to us. So the decisions that we make today, whether it's as an unbeliever or as a Christian to simply be God's disciple, Christ's disciple, is very, very important. If you have never settled your relationship with Jesus Christ, then I, I beg you to follow Bartimaeus' example and cry out to the Messiah, Jesus, as a guilty sinner for his mercy that he showed you when he died for you on the cross and his promises that he will forgive your sins and give you eternal life. Finally, fellow believer, let's follow Bartimaeus' example as a true disciple of Jesus. After his healing and conversion, what did Bartimaeus do? He instantly, he enthusiastically followed Jesus on the road, on the way. These are all key phrases in Mark. To follow Jesus is to be his disciple. To be on the way is to be his disciple with him. Are you following Jesus, brother, sister in Christ, as his disciple? A medical missionary operated on a blind man in the jungle, and because of the nature of the eye condition, the doctor restored the man's sight. Later, after the bandages came off and the man could see, he returned to the missionary with ten blind people holding on to a rope. Now, you know, we can laugh at that man's ignorance for thinking that this doctor could cure all blindness, but we can't condemn his heart for wanting others to have the gift of sight that he had received. That is why God saves us, brothers and sisters, so that when God takes the blinders from our eyes spiritually, we will be able to see clearly to show the path of salvation to others. Amen. That is why He heals and saves us, so that we in turn can do that same thing for others. I want to finish today not just this sermon, but I want to finish this whole part one of Mark by opening your eyes by painting a grand panorama of Mark, the writer's incredible gospel port. I want to show you how just the Bartimaeus story fits into the entire gospel and beyond. How did Act 2 begin? It began with Jesus healing another blind man. This whole second section, this whole second act of Mark basically has two healings of blind people at the beginning and the end, two confessions of Jesus. Let's look at it. Notice again this X pattern, this X structure, this what is called a chiasm, a Rorschach, if you will. Jesus and his disciples come. He heals an unnamed blind man in two stages. Peter confesses Jesus is Messiah. Jesus teaches about what a true disciple is like on the way all through this three chapters. Bartimaeus confesses Jesus is Messiah. Jesus and his disciples come and Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus instantly. Again, there's a couple of differences, instant healing, two-stage healing, but the entire section fits together, framed by two healings. Why did Mark do that? At this point, the Jesus' disciples were like that, slow, oh so slow to get it. But by this time, they're beginning to get it. That's encouraging to me. Let's move forward. Compare James and John, whom we studied last week, with Bartimaeus. Sons of Zebedee said, teacher, literally rabbi, do something for us. Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, cries out, son of David, have mercy. Notice, sons of Zebedee, son of Timaeus, son of David. Jesus asked the same question to James and John that he asked to Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? But the answers were very different. James and John answer, allow us to sit at your right and left in your glory. Bartimaeus answers, Rabuni, my Lord and Master, I want to see. And he had been sitting. They want to sit in glory. He was sitting by the side of the road. 
They call him just a teacher like any other rabbi in Israel. He says, my Lord and Master. Very different hearts. And these are the guys who were Jesus' official disciples, Jesus' inner circle. They are blindly self-confident. Sure, we're able to be baptized and to drink your cup. Bartimaeus sees his desperate need when he is blind. They want to be first. They want to be great. Bartimaeus follows Jesus like a servant, like a slave, not out front. Those with two good eyes do not see. He with no eyes does see. Mark's famous irony. Once again, move forward. Let's go back to what we said a couple of weeks ago. Rich young ruler compared to Bartimaeus. Rich young ruler met Jesus as he was going on the road, on the way. Bartimaeus was sitting by the way. And by the way, at the end of your notes today, look and see what the significance of by is. Rich young ruler ran up to Jesus. Bartimaeus jumped up and came to Jesus. I'm sure he was running as fast as he could. Rich young ruler, top of the social ladder. He had many possessions. Bartimaeus, bottom of that ladder, a blind beggar. Rich young ruler said, good teacher. What must I do? And as we talked about, that wasn't a compliment to Jesus. Son of David, a high title, the Messiah is what Bartimaeus says. Have mercy on me. Jesus replies to the rich young ruler, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, like Bartimaeus, follow me. Jesus tells Bartimaeus, go your way. Your faith has healed you. The rich young ruler went away grieving because he was unwilling to give up anything. Bartimaeus began to follow Jesus on the road. He threw off his coat. He willingly left everything. The rich young ruler left spiritually blind, spiritually lost. Bartimaeus left with sight and spiritually saved. Incredible contrast. Let's keep going. Bartimaeus joins other noble Gentiles in Mark's gospel who became model disciples. We've already seen them. The Gerasene ex-demoniac. First thing that he did when he was freed from those demons, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, no, you go back home and tell people what I did for you. People I can't reach, you can reach. The Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile, an outcast, whose daughter, from whose daughter Jesus also cast out a demon. And looking ahead to next year, and if the only thing that I pray doesn't come in the meantime is that I, I pray Jesus does come. But if he doesn't come, I pray that we'll have a chance to look at this high point of Act 3, when the Roman centurion gives the greatest confession of all of Jesus. He is the Son of God in the lips, on the lips of a Gentile. Contrast the faith of these people. Bartimaeus, the garrison next demoniac, the Syrophoenician woman, the Roman centurion, people that the Jews would have turned up their noses at. Contrast this faith with most of those in the Jewish nation who blindly rejected Jesus as the Messiah, including the 70-member Supreme Court of Israel with maybe two votes in Jesus' favor, Nicodemus and Joseph, and 68 against Jesus. We'll talk about that next year, Lord willing. And Jesus' own disciples, who were so plodding and so slow and so blind, the only way I can describe their progress spiritually, like Frank Carmichael, is glacial velocity. One inch every 10,000 years. Let's keep going. Next slide. A long coat was the most important garment people wore. They used it as a blanket against the cold at night, a poncho against sun, wind, and rain. So why did... Bartimaeus leave this coat behind. Three possibilities. First, Bartimaeus was in such a hurry to get to Jesus, he wanted nothing to get in his way. Do you have that type of enthusiasm about obeying Jesus and following Jesus, that you don't want anything to get in your way? I would like to tell you that I'm like that, but oftentimes I allow many obstacles to get in my way of serving Jesus. We need to be like Bartimaeus. Our second possibility, why did he leave the coat? Every other disciple in Mark gives up something to follow Jesus. Nets, boats, fathers, livelihood. Bartimaeus gives up his most valuable possession, maybe his only possession, that coat, to follow Jesus. 
And the third one, I love this possibility. A blind person, our brother Kyle in the back can tell you, would never throw aside something as valuable as a coat. Why? He'd never find it again. In the meantime, somebody would steal it. Bartimaeus' faith was so great. I believe he believed Jesus would cure him and he would be able to go back and see to find that coat. Amazing faith. Does that describe our faith? Next, in Mark, clothes always symbolizes the person who wears those clothes, something about them. John the Baptist's rough clothes, imitating Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament. The woman with bleeding believed Jesus that just touching his robe was enough to heal her. Jesus' disciples showed their faith by not packing an extra shirt. Jesus' clothes were transfigured and became dazzling white, showing his deity. Again, at the end of your notes today, I'll give you examples in the rest of Mark about clothes. So why does Mark put so much emphasis on clothes? I've often mentioned how Mark was Peter's disciple, and he was. But remember, Mark was also Paul's disciple. And many places Paul writes about clothes, like Ephesians 4.22. He, Paul says, you took off your former way of life, the old self, corrupted by deceitful desires. You put on the new self, created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. Paul uses clothes to symbolize taking off the old life and putting on the new life in Christ. And I think from Mark's discipleship under Paul, he brings that same emphasis through the gospel story of taking off the old and putting on the new in order to follow Jesus. That's why he talks about clothes. And finally, let's make this global. Where How does Bartimaeus fit with the Old Testament? Let's go forward. Rahab, remember her? Bartimaeus. She was a Gentile from where? Jericho. He was a Gentile from Jericho. She was the bottom of the social ladder, a prostitute and pagan. He was the bottom of that ladder, a blind beggar. Oh, brothers and sisters, it is such a wonderful thing to be part of the family of God. When we get together in heaven someday to be there with Rahab, the former prostitute, with Bartimaeus, the former beggar, and with all the saints of history, the centurion, and all these other wonderful people, there's no reason why someone should not be a Christian. And you have no excuse for not being a Christian when God would offer so much what did she say? Please show kindness, show mercy to my family. Jesus, have mercy on me, is what Bartimaeus said. By faith, Hebrews tells us, Rahab received and hid the spies. Jesus says, your faith has healed and saved you. She was justified that as she proved her faith by her works, Bartimaeus proved his faith by following Jesus. She hung a scarlet cord or rope or cloth out the window to signal the spies when they returned. He threw off his coat, both made of cloth. She became an ancestor of King David. He cried out to King Jesus, son and descendant of David. She was rescued by Joshua, which in Hebrew means the Lord saves. Bartimaeus was saved by Jesus, which in Greek means Joshua. Brothers and sisters, the whole Bible fits together so amazingly. I hope that you have enjoyed part one of our series in Mark, the very long series. And I pray if there's nothing else that you have come away with in these many months together studying, that you have grown in your appreciation of how wonderful and how marvelous God's Word is. And even more, I pray that you have grown in your love for and your appreciation and your worship for the Lord Jesus Christ, because He is the one that Mark is about. Let's follow Him, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Son of David. And let's follow him all the way to death and beyond as his disciple. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for the book of Mark, which is so amazing in what it tells us about Jesus and the challenges it gives to us. Help me, help all of us this week to do more, to trust more, to try more, to be your disciple. For those who have not yet crossed the line into the kingdom, Father, I pray that you would burden their hearts through your Holy Spirit to put their faith once and for all in the finished work 
of great mercy that Jesus did on the cross. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you.